There is a Fallout game you've never played, and never will. How did the game's demise herald the downfall of one of gaming's biggest development giants? This story is a wild ride of financial mismanagement, corporate rivalry, and ultimately redemption. How did a financial crash destroy a gaming giant, and how did their direct rival acquire their multi-billion dollar IP from right under their nose? This is the story of Fallout Van Buren, the Fallout game you've never played and never will. In this video, we'll put together what the game could have been, what little we know or suspect of its story and plot, and uncover how the game's downfall was intertwined with the death of a beloved gaming studio. We'll also examine how the spirit of Fallout Van Buren lives in the RPG world to this day. Videos like this take a lot of research and time, so hitting the like button and subscribe is a great idea if you want more videos like this one on the history of RPGs, as it lets me know there's more people out there enjoying it. So let's begin. For the life of me, I cannot find a confirmed date for the exact beginning of development, but we can assume it began around the release of Fallout 2, or perhaps sometime before so sometime around 1998 to 1999. The two leads of the project, Chris Avalon and Josh Sawyer, were taking over from Fergus Urquhart, the founder of Black Isle Studios, who also served as the lead on Fallout 2. Now, I'm sure the mention of these two names immediately brings sadness to the hearts of any hardcore Black Isle fans. But for those who it doesn't, let me explain. Both Chris Avalon and Josh Sawyer are legends in the RPG development industry. Josh Sawyer designed and developed what are, in my opinion, two of the best RPGs of all time, Icewind Dale and Fallout New Vegas. Chris Avalon, on the other hand, is a narrative genius who devoted his talents as the lead designer of the somewhat controversial but generally acclaimed Knights of the Old Republic II, a game that took the Star Wars universe in a new and darker direction that's yet to be matched, as well as the also-dark cult classic Planescape Torment. He's been a writer on more or less every good RPG released at some point over the last two decades, because people know that there are few narrative designers better than he is. Maybe that's a bit of an over-exaggeration, but you get the point. The TLDR is that this was a dream team of game development, two young game dev leads in the absolute prime of their creativity working for a company that respected the franchise, and by God, they were going to make a new Fallout game that was going to blow everyone out of the water. And then it all came tumbling down. But we'll get to that later. Let's take a look at what the game actually would have been like, especially for those of you that aren't super familiar with the early side of the Fallout series. From the technical side, Fallout Van Buren would have been similar in many ways to Fallout 2 using new 3D graphics, but still keeping the same top-down isometric camera. This was in keeping with Black Isle's new interest in 3D games such as Neverwinter Nights. In my view, the new graphics as we see in the tech demo and also saw in games like Neverwinter Nights have not aged particularly well compared to the studio's 2D games. But what you have to remember is, at the time, this was revolutionary. Now, a video on the flaws of early 3D RPGs is a topic for another time, but let's just say that in this era, 3D things were very exciting and neither gamers nor game developers were as sensitive to the downsides of 3D as we are now. And thus we saw the revival of many 2D RPGs either through remakes or new franchises in the coming years such as Pillars of Eternity. The game's systems would be more or less similar to Fallout 2 as well, but with substantial revisions to the core RPG mechanics made by Josh Sawyer himself. These revisions, at least in my opinion, fall somewhat between the classical mechanics of Fallout 1 and 2, but also hint at some of the newer mechanics we would see in later games. The special system would make a return. For those of you that have never played a Fallout game before, the special system is an acronym for Strength, Perception, Endurance, Charisma, Intelligence, Agility, and Luck. These were the seven basic attributes of every character in the game and are used to determine what skills and perks are available to the characters. Introduced as a new system by Josh Sawyer would be the derived stats. The initial perk stats would function as a basis to derive lots of smaller derivative stats that could be used to determine things like the damage that players take from fire or radiation 
as well as things like speech skills. Also making a return would be the perk system. In Van Buren, however, perks would no longer be tied to a character's level, but would depend instead on their stats or skills. High-level characters would get access to new, higher-level perks, the assumed incentive being that getting really high in a particular skill would open up new, interesting perks and allow for greater diversity of character builds. Overall, there seemed to have been a lot of promising ideas in Van Buren's game design that would either come out in later Fallout games or other RPGs that would go on to be made by its designers. Everything game design-wise made Fallout Van Buren out to be a more maturely designed game than the previous two Fallout games, with more thought put into the interaction between the character's design and their choices, with the apparent goal of allowing for more diversity of builds, something that's always been a tricky thing to achieve in the Fallout series. What we do know of the game's storyline is very speculative, and much of what I will say here I can't find explicit sources for, but I trust the Fallout lore buffs out there with what they have done, and they've probably done their best to piece things together. Nonetheless, don't bite my head off if some of this is wrong. According to compiled fan data, the game would begin with the player character in a prison cell, and because of this, the player would be given a choice. The player could be an innocent that was imprisoned because of a misunderstanding, or they could choose to be a criminal and return from some negative social penalties, get bonus traits to their skills. The game would open with the player awakening in their prison cell, but not the one they remembered falling asleep in. Suddenly, the floor would be violently shook from an explosion, and the player would be knocked unconscious. When they awakened, they would find their cell door opened or a hole in the wall leading to the outside. Upon leaving the prison, the character would then be attacked by some unknown assailant. They would decide to flee the situation and then run out to explore this new world. Eventually, as the player explored the world, they would go on to discover the true reason behind the prison and the attack on it. It would turn out that there is a mad scientist named Presper, who has become disgusted with what the world has turned into after the war. Upon the discovery of Plague, the virus that FEV was designed to cure, he would discover its genocidal potency and a viable means to cleanse the world. Using Odysseus, the quarantine prison, as well as a ballistic satellite known as the Bomb, Presper would then seek to control the bomb satellite and use it to annihilate the surface of the Earth. Presper would then gather up the escaped prisoners from Odysseus until he was certain that the world was safe for pure-blood humans again. In other words, Presper would use one nuclear holocaust to fix another. So this is what I hope will be a long series of videos on game dev and RPGs, and if you've watched this far into the video, you know, spam those necessary buttons. I need the dopamine hit to keep me going in the basement audio studio I live in. And if you do, oh, I'll see you in the next video. But now we've got to the negative side of this video. As much as you and I enjoy creative RPGs with amazing stories and great game mechanics that allow us to creatively engage with these amazing worlds, there is a business side to game development. And that is sadly the way things went wrong for Fallout Van Buren. Unlike many other past and certainly future videos in this series, the game devs themselves are, as far as I can tell, absolutely free of any wrongdoing. Fallout Van Buren was shaping up to be a masterpiece of an RPG, one that probably would have gone down as one of the greatest RPGs of the era, if not all time. To revive an old 2000s meme, Black Isle did nothing wrong. So this is a story of game dev gone wrong, where tragically the game devs really did absolutely everything right. And this brings us to the other character in our story, Interplay Entertainment. If you're an older millennial or a Gen X gamer, you will no doubt know this logo. The company was founded not as a publisher, but as a game developer in 1983 by former Boone Corporation colleagues Brian Fargo, Troy Well, and Jay Patel as long as investors from the University of California. Initially, they would develop games for both EA and Activision, with their big hit being the legendary series The Bard's Tale. Coming out of the 80s and into the early 90s, the company saw huge success, creating a splinter studio called Black Isle Studios to develop RPGs, as well as acquiring Shiny Studios and their famous IP, the Earthworm Jim series. In the early 90s, Interplay could do no wrong. The Interplay sticker on a game at your local game store meant that it was worth begging your parents for money to buy it, or worth the money from your part-time job. It was a sign of quality, 
from Earthworm Jim to Boulder's Gate to the Descent series on PC. Interplay seemingly could do no wrong in a world where PC games were often shambling disappointments. Interplay were a beacon of quality and creativity, at least for the most part. But they weren't the only kid on the block. New game developers were springing up everywhere, especially in the PC space. In 1993, ID Software would release Doom and forever change the space of PC gaming. Not just a few years later, a little game studio would be founded by two former Microsoft employees, Gabe Newell and Mike Harrington. And in 1996, new competition would emerge in Todd Howard's Bethesda, releasing their Daggerfall Elder Scrolls series in that year. ID Software, Valve, and other studios like them would go on to push the boundaries of PC gaming further than it had ever been pushed before, leaving companies like Interplay pumping out sports titles trying to make a quick buck, with their big-name franchises like Boulder's Gate now looking and feeling much more niche in this world of 3D-accelerated gaming with much more accessible titles. By 1998, Interplay's finances were in a terrible state, and so it made the fateful decision to go public on the then-amazingly successful tech exchange, the NASDAQ. I mean, obviously, they would think this would save the company. Being listed on one of the world's foremost dot-com exchanges couldn't go wrong. The NASDAQ had seen an 800% growth over the past two years. But by October 2002, the NASDAQ had fallen 740% from its peak by October 2002 giving up all its gains during the, what was now claimed to be a bubble. And it was at this point that Fall of Van Buren was cancelled, along with many other Interplay projects. And Interplay itself was delisted from the NASDAQ, as the company was no longer considered valuable enough to be worth trading. Black Isle Studios would be shuttered the next year in 2003, with a brief revival as part of a failed Kickstarter campaign in 2012, which is maybe a story for another time. In the end, all we have left from Fall of Van Buren is a tech demo, some speculation, and its legacy that is still felt today in the Fallout universe. Josh Scheuer would leave Black Isle with the cancellation of the project and go on to found Obsidian Studios in June of 2003. Meanwhile, as a deal with its creditors, Interplay would sell the rights to the Fallout IP to their direct competitor in 2004. In a Machiavellian twist, one of the companies that had taken their market share and put them out of business would now take from them their very IPs. One of Black Isle's greatest IPs would then go on to make their direct competitor more money than Black Isle probably could have ever imagined was possible from the IP in the first place. Fans would then go a full decade without a Fallout game, until, in 2008, Bethesda would release Fallout 3. Fallout 3 took little to nothing from what was done in development of Van Buren and involved little to none of the original Black Isle team. However, it was critically acclaimed and led Bethesda Software to new heights, as they now had not only the amazingly successful Elder Scrolls series, but would use the same game engine they had designed for the Elder Scrolls series to explore this new IP that they had acquired from their direct rivals. Now, though, Bethesda had a problem. They had conquered their rivals and achieved a massive hit with their newly acquired IP, but they needed to make at least two more games with their investment. The issue that Bethesda faced now is that their main dev team was busy working developing a little game called Skyrim and wasn't able to immediately begin work on a sequel to Fallout 3. Bethesda, being Bethesda, thought to themselves, hey, didn't that Josh Sawyer guy work on a Fallout game he never got to finish? And so they reached out to Sawyer's recently founded Obsidian Studios to hire them to develop a game that would become Fallout New Vegas. New Vegas would employ many of the ideas both in terms of new stats and gameplay systems. The game would explore the arrival of both Caesar's Legion and the NRC in the Mojave Desert, and would, at least in this man's humble opinion, go on to flesh out the world of Fallout in much more detail than Fallout 3 did. Not only would Obsidian Studios succeed in turning out Fallout New Vegas as a quick sequel to Fallout 3, with development only taking two and a half years, it would go on to become acclaimed as perhaps the greatest RPG ever made to this day. Is this a happy ending? I don't know. For the team that worked on Van Buren, it still must sting. Losing years of work, narrative, and design, 
For fans of more traditional pre-Bethesda Fallout games, the frustration in not knowing what could have been will always be there. But we can all be thankful as gamers that, despite the dot-com bubble killing Interplay and its subsidiaries, the fascinating world of Fallout exists and will continue to exist for years and years to come. If you've watched to the end of this video, thank you, and I'll see you in the next one. If there's any aspect of the story I misrepresented or missed out on, let me know in the comments and I'll get back to you. Until then, see you next time.